Welcome back to John's Films. Today we're going to examine what is so special about cinema cameras. And tomorrow we're going to look at encoding quality. I'm sure there are thousands of reasons these cameras are special, but we're going to start and analyze today the film storage mechanism that these cameras use. Well, what are these cameras? Full-on cinema cameras. And yes, I understand the Pocket Cinema 4K may not be a uh, professional tool. It's more of a prosumer world, but it does have one thing in common with the Ari Alexa at top and the red weapon in the middle. That is, they all shoot RAW. Well, what does RAW mean? It means that the sensor at the heart of the camera takes all of the light data that it captures across various pixels, the sensor being broken up pixel by pixel all the way across and down, and it stores it in its native format, meaning it captures every bit of data it has on the light, the luminance, the hue, and stores it in binary form onto the disk. Now, they have different formats, and they have to be read different ways, but they also have different sensors that are written in. And these formats are created explicitly to capture all of the data off the sensor and store it to the hard drive. How's that different from these cameras, like the GH5 I typically shoot on here at top, and say an A7R3, both prosumer cameras that have their place in video? What do they do differently? Well, they capture the data in binary form, just like this, representing all of the luminance and hue on the camera sensor. And then they compress it, and they store it in, say, H.264 compression. What does that do to the data? Well, if we look at it compared to the RAW, on the left you see the RAW camera, and that's all captured data, every bit, with no inferred pixels required, and they are huge files based on the amount of data that it captures. What do I mean by inferring pixels? We'll get to that in a second. Over on the right, you see compressed, that's a GH5 shooting in H.264, and it has a reduced data set, uh, meaning it's reduced the size of that data set, making it easier to move it around and store on that camera. The playback calculations are required. Finally, again, it's smaller files, and that's something that becomes pretty handy as you're trying to port those around, play them on the internet maybe, etc. So what do these graphs at the bottom mean? Well, this is a view, visual representation of frame by frame uh, in one second. So you've got a 30 frames a second you're shooting. Let's pretend this is 30 lines. And truly video is a collection of pictures played back very quickly. So if we think of each of these frames as one full picture, what we really have here is 30 complete pictures that you could scroll through at any time and see each individual picture and when they're played back, there's no visual degradation from picture to picture because every picture has a complete view of the data that was captured in that split second. Over here with the GH5, however, it's a different story. Let's dig into it. You saw earlier, this is the GH5 story, and it starts with a complete picture. But then, for any number of frames afterwards, it stores half the data or a third of the data related to the prior frame. And when a computer plays this back, it takes all of the data from the first one and sets it as a baseline. It plays the first frame out of it, and then it moves on to the second frame. When it gets to the second frame, it has to infer, based on the data from the first frame, what the rest of this picture should look like, construct it, and play it back in that instant that it needs to be played. It'll go about this examining inferring pixels for the next X number of frames and determine at another point where it will take a full iframe or intraframe, which is again a complete data snapshot that it'll then use from frame to frame to frame. As an example, if we consider these two frames which are back to back in a sequence, the first frame is what we call an intraframe. This intraframe represents a complete scene and a complete image, which we'll play back. The second frame here, we would consider an interframe. The interframe only has the data necessary to reconstruct the frame as it would play back. That's the blue part that would have to be inferred by the computer. Whereas 
the first frame has a complete data set. So how does this work? Well, quite simply, the second frame and the computer have to ask the first frame, what was it like when you shot this? And then apply any changes on top of it. So all it stores is the football. But when it plays it back, it merges the two frames together, analyzing the changes and rendering them out to the computer. This is what helps us save space, but increases complexity on playback for the computer. So when we talk about my shooting and editing, I'm typically shooting in a smaller format. Editing, if I transcode, which is done to make it easier for the computer to play back during editing, in a larger format, and then I deliver again in a smaller format for YouTube so that people can stream it across. Typical formats that I use while shooting, editing, and in delivery are shooting on my GH5 and H.264, on an iPhone or other device that shoots in H.265. I'll shoot uh, edit in DNX HQ, which I have to transcode. That means uh, adapt and change the footage into a new storage mechanism, and so I'm taking H.264, I transcode it into DNX HQ using the optimized media option in DaVinci Resolve, or using the media encoder to create proxy files in Premiere Pro. And then when I want to deliver, I'll use my cut up footage that's been treated through my editing process and transcode it back to either H.264 or H.265. Now, the real meat of this, you wonder, am I losing quality? Is my H.264 file I shoot up front the same exact quality as the H.264 on the, on the other side? Tomorrow, I will post a video that objectively proves how much quality is lost as you transcode. Look forward to it, and I'll see you back here on the channel. Thanks for watching.